I will start. We'll go over files as well, uh, briefly. Um, files was technically part of the, the second half of, or the, 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 the two thirds of the course. So we'll go into it as it pertains to writing the story, but not like too much in depth. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, give me a second slideshow. Okay, so welcome to our CSC A08 final exam review uh, with Katrina uh, with Katrina Best and me, Alex, um, run by AMAC. Um, and without further ado, we will get started. If you have any questions, uh, no, you don't need to build classes. If you have any questions, just uh, say them in the chat or use the hand raise function. And if you say something in the chat, Katrina will uh, spot out and we can answer for you uh and i'll try to go as uh in depth and as slowly as possible so just to make sure everyone understands um but i think that's all so without further ado let's get started all right so we have basically three main topics to cover technically four but uh, three main ones. So we're going to go over generating a new story again. And this was be, this is because it allows us to go over a lot of the concepts that were in the third part of the course a lot. It's it's a really important example, and you'll probably have something similar to, uh, to it on your exam. So it's kind of important to understand. We'll then cover unit testing briefly. Uh, there isn't a whole lot to cover with unit testing, but we're going to try to like just show you how to do it basically and the idea behind it. And then we'll go on to like the three main sorting algorithms that you went over, which are selection sort, insertion sort, and bubble sort. Um, and we'll also go over complexity briefly. Uh, again, there isn't too much to cover when it comes to complexity, at least for this course, um, but it is important to know. So let's go uh, into our first talk. Okay, so uh, first part of generating a new story, uh, dictionaries. We wanna understand dictionaries because they are an important, uh, type data type in Python that we're going to be using to do this. Um, okay, so basically the idea behind dictionaries is they store values in key value pairs. So you'll have like a key and then you can access like sort of like how you access a list through its indexes, you can access the values through the keys in the list. Um, another important thing to note here is that the keys must be immutable. This is so they can't change because you don't want like the key to a value changing because that's that that would be very not good because that would cause all sorts of issues in your program. So they can't be, for example, lists, because lists you can actually directly modify in memory. They can't be other dictionaries because you can directly modify dictionaries in memory. So basically anything that can be directly modified in memory by like another function cannot be a key. So lists, dictionaries, et cetera. Um, anything can be stored as values. You can store other dictionaries, you can store lists, you can store strings whatever you want honestly um and remember use the uh the curly braces not not these two this is for tuples this is for lists this is for dictionaries i had this issue a lot when i did this course and i don't want anyone else to fall victim to it so just note use the curly braces they are your best friend all right so here are some examples of dictionaries um so we have epic people here. Uh, we have Alex, Katrina, and AMAC, and then in it is a list of our majors starting here. Uh, then we have cool profs, which is uh, Anya, Anna, and Natalia, and their courses sort of strings under the keys. Then we have pair to pair, and if you, uh, as you can see here, we have tuple. We have a tuple as the key and a string as the value stored under the key. Uh, technically, this shouldn't be equals. It should be the little dots right there, but that's fine. Uh, give me a sec. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. So yeah, technically it shouldn't it shouldn't be uh, equals. It should be these, but um, it doesn't matter. I mean, the main point is you have tuple as key and string as value. Um, okay, here are some useful methods to remember. So you have get, and this returns the value uh, specified at the given key. So uh, for example, like if I want to get a value from Epic People, uh, Alex, right, this will give me the list that's stored uh, in this place. Um, the values, uh, I, I actually think you can uh, directly reference the dictionary too with respect to the key. 
Um, but yeah, this exists. So yeah, and then you have dot values and this just returns a list of all the values in the dictionary. So let's say I only care about the values. I don't care about the keys. Then I can do something like this, like for value and cool profs values. And I can print out their courses basically. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so we're gonna now think about how we're gonna program. Uh, and this is important. The main idea is that we want a program that looks through a text file, uses a certain number of words as the context, and then generates a new story using that context. So here's like a sample. Uh, we have Alex and Katrina are cool. We're gonna make a two, con if we're gonna make a two word context for the story, it would be a two tuple. Uh, Alex and and then Katrina and Katrina R. Katrina R. Cool and then awesome, right? Because we have Katrina R and then cool comes after. But we also have awesome here. So there's two different words that come after that context. Uh, we have R. Cool and then Alex after it. And then we have cool Alex and then ant. Uh, ignore the capitalization there. Uh, the point is the idea of having the two word context and the tuples for the context. Um, yeah, so that's basically the main idea. We're going to go through the story, uh, pick out two word context. So basically, we'll go through every like second word. So Alex and and Katrina, etc. And we'll put uh, something in this list if it's not already in there, and then store the words to come after. And that's basically the new idea, the main idea. Then after we'll use this and we'll randomly pick words after. And then so for example, if we have Alex and as our current context, and we pick Katrina, the new context becomes and Katrina. Uh, yeah, and then we, if we have Katrina R and I pick cool, then the next context becomes cool. And if I pick R awesome, then uh, that context actually doesn't exist because there's nothing that comes after it. So we just pick a random context from this list. Okay, so we have to choose a data type to model our data. And this is another really important concept in this course, like thinking about what the best data type is to design a program. And I'm sure a lot of you a public, I guess, we're going to be using tuples as our keys because this allows us to store a context of any size. And tuples are really nice because they're immutable, so we can use them as keys. That's really good. And we're obviously going to use a list of strings uh, for the values because we want to store the words that come after. Um, so, for example, here would be like a dictionary that of tuples and lists as the values. Um, yeah, not, not too much to explain here. Um, yeah, this, this would just be what models our data. Okay, so uh, we're going to read from the file now. So um, essentially we want to have a list of every word in the file that's split at the spaces. If you'd want to split it something else, you can just put something in as your split argument. But for this, we're just gonna use the spaces. So uh, this will give us a really easy way to look through each word, like loop through it, and then see which word comes after the next one. So that's really helpful. So this is the best way to do it for our specific uh, task. So there's a very easy way to do this. Uh, you can simply just take in your file, you read it. And if you remember, the read function on a file will give just a single string that consists of every single, um, basically, every single thing in your file. It will include new lines, but split treats new lines as empties. So it will just split uh, each of them anyways, like if they're on a new line. So you'll get basically this. Um, uh, in case anyone was just uh, wanted a refresher on um, file reading, a read line would just read a single line and then go to the next line in the file. And then read do read lines do? I, I, I don't remember what uh, read, read lines did specifically, but you can also loop through the file in a for loop too if you want to go through each line individually as well. Um, Sorry, can I intervene? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so read lines does give you a list of strings. It basically does what read uh, dot split does as well. Um, it just okay. does it in one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so you could also use read lines here too as well. Uh, either one works. Uh, I don't know which one is more efficient or not, I can't So say. for this way, actually, um, if you use split and you want to have the separator be something else besides the default, which is a space, you would want to use this way because with read lines, it only, I believe, only does it with spaces. Yep. 
Thank you, Katrina. Um, yeah, so that's basically the main idea. We just use this to get this list and that will help us with our task. Okay, so uh, here is an example of, or here's uh, essentially uh, the idea behind our reading, the uh, our read words function. So essentially we will have three method or basically yeah, three uh, functions in for this read words um, function. Basically we'll have three separate functions that do different things. So we'll have return a file read.split. This will give us our list as we discussed before. So it basically returns a list in the order they appear. And uh, something I will stress is that the file is already open for reading. So do not reopen or close the file within the function. Most files where you have, uh, or where, where you're working with a file, it's assumed that the file is already open. And this is because you don't really want to deal with that inside a function, because then it gets really awkward because you have a function that has like two functionalities, like opening the file and doing something with it, but you want to separate those functionalities. So um, unless otherwise stated um, in a function that takes in a file, you assume the file is already open for reading. Um, yeah, so then we have reads. Read will just return the string uh, of the chi contents in the file. It's just a single string. It will include the new lines wherever there is new lines and splits will split at a separator. Uh, whatever you pick to be the separator um, in this argument will be what it splits at. By default, it's just a space. All right, so here's an example of building a context to words, so, uh, of building our actual dictionary, right, that we discussed before. So we start, we initialize an empty dictionary here. Um, yeah, this is so we can uh, actually add the stuff to it because we, we need to initialize in the first place. Um, so we essentially loop through our list of words that we've already gotten, right? And notice we have range, len, word list, minus context size. This is because we want to go up to the very, like we want to go up to, but not actually at the final place in, in, the, uh, in the word list, essentially. So we want to uh, adjust for that using the context size, right? Because like if we have three words, three words, three words, we'll be at the end with, uh, with three, uh, even though the word list might be like size six, right? So we only want to be looping through three times, for example, if we had like a context uh, size of three. So we uh, create uh, a new context key, right? Which is simply just our word list, our current, our current word list, right? Um, I plus I plus context size. Um, so we're basically looking through what, uh, what the current uh, context size uh, words are, right? So this will give us our new context depending on the size, right? And this just turns it, this is just type casting it to a tuple because we don't want a list. Lists are uh, uh, mutable. We don't want mutable as our keys. So we just type cast it to a tuple. Uh, we retrieve uh, a new word to add it to the context, right? So we used to do word equals word list I plus context size. And this is just the word that comes after essentially. And then if our context is already in our dictionary, right? So this is kind of important to stress right here. If the context we created is already in the dictionary, there's no need to create a new key context. We're simply just going to append the current um, word to that current key, right? Because we already have the context in that dictionary. But if it isn't, then we're going to create a new key. And this is simply done just by initializing like another key, which is context towards context, right? So you would just do context word with your context that isn't in the dictionary, and then you set a list and then word to it. But if it's already in the dictionary, then you create a list already. So you would just append word to it. And then finally we return it. And that's the full process. Sorry, that was a lot. Um, okay, and then here is the generate story function. And this actually creates our story, right? So this will uh, return a string, which is our story, right? So. Uh, this will actually use once we have um, once we have the context to word dictionary. This is actually very easy to implement because we basically have all the data now. We can just go through it basically. So we have our context, and then this will be a get random context context to words, and this is basically our starting context, right? So get random context. All this does is just grabs a random key from our dictionary, um, and this is just going to be the one we start with. So then we go for in range num words. So 
obviously we want to create a story with a certain amount of words. This will loop through. Uh, this will go through the for loop process for uh, the number of words we want in our story. Um, and then the words will equal to context towards context. Um, and yeah, so essentially what this will do is um, this will grab the list of words that come after our context. And then the next word, so the word we're going to put into our story is a random choice out of that list. So we have a list of words that come after our context. Then we're going to choose a random one and we're going to add it to our story, right? Uh, we're going to put a new space uh, next to it, obviously, because we want the words to be separated by spaces. And then we create a new context. So essentially what we do is we take out the first word from our context and then add in the one we just added to our story to be the last word of the context. And this will create a new tuple, right, which is our next context. And when we get to the end of the story, right, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to basically get a new context, right? So if the context we have isn't in our dictionary, essentially, then that means we've reached the end of the story. There's nothing more after that. So the thing we want to do is we want to grab a random context in that case. Otherwise, we just go through the for loop normally with that context and keep going. Uh, but if it's not in the a dictionary, well, we need to grab a new random one. And then after that, we return the story. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that, uh, by the way? Um, I know that's a lot to take in, so. OK. Now we just need to finish up. And we have one more function, uh, generate random story that takes in our data file, the number of words we want in our story and the context size, and this will create our story. This is sort of the function that, uh, will this PowerPoint be noise? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, how do I, sorry, give me a second. Uh, do you know how to go back? Uh, Katrina, do you know how to go back on the PowerPoint? Uh, I think you can use the arrow keys. Okay, give me a second. Uh, if not, I can just use it. We're on the bottom left. Bottom left, okay. Oh yeah, here you go. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, um, so we're finally gonna finish up our new story. This is the function that brings everything together. This will take in a data file we want. This will take in the number of words we want, and this will take in the context size we want, and this will give us our new story. Um, all words, so we're, again, we're gonna just read, read the words from the data file. This will give us our list. Context to words is just gonna be build context to words, which we discussed before. And then finally, we'll call our jet will return what generate story returns. And this is just context words and the number of words we want, essentially. Um, and yeah, you just call this from the main method. This wraps everything up and we get a random story. So great. We, we basically wrapped everything, all the functions we've been discussing up into one nice, neat package. And then calling this from the main method or calling this from the command line, you can just print a new story from any data file you want. Okay, uh, does anybody have any questions or is it okay if we go on to the next topic? Okay. Okay, so unit testing. So this is something I, I know a lot of you probably wanted to go over. So the idea, we'll go over the idea behind unit testing quickly. Um, basically it gives you a nicer way of testing your code. Uh, compared to doc test because doc test as you've seen on assignment three and assignment two is very finicky um, and it's not really nice to work with for uh, larger data types like dicks and uh, lists so we use unit testing for uh, functions more complicated functions so there's two kinds of unit testing we're going to be over we're going to be testing functions that just return things and we're going to be testing functions that mutate certain objects so the difference is one will just give you a value. So it'll just output a value, it won't modify anything. But functions that mutate certain objects essentially will change that object, right? So you'll have an object, you'll pass it in, and that object directly in memory will be modified. And nothing will be returned, but the object itself will be changed. So uh, for the purposes of the seminar, we'll examine the following two functions. So we have the function return list that takes in cool list and just returns a list. So Importantly here, um, so that return statement should be outside, but uh, that's besides the point. The important thing to note here is that uh, cool list is not actually being modified, right? So we're not actually doing anything to cool list. We're just going through the objects and then 
adding in the objects plus one, right? So we're just returning a list of everything in the new list plus one. A uh, modify list, however, is a little bit different. So this time for this function, we're looping through cool list by its index. And if you notice, we're directly modifying the index. And uh, as you, you all probably know at this point, uh, doing that directly modifies the list in memory. So that's important to know. These are very, the, these do similar things, but very different. Like their result is very different. One doesn't return anything, modifies a list. One just returns a list of integers. Okay, so we're gonna go over a non-mutant uh, example of a unit test. So we have the class test return list. I know a lot of you were probably worried about creating classes. Uh, don't worry too much about this. This just defines sort of a, a testing object, but the important part is all of this is wrapped up in this class. Um, then you have def test return list. So this will be our, our actual test. Um, and this is a single test and it'll have self inside of it. Uh, so here's the idea, right? So we have our actual value. This is essentially what our return list function does. So essentially this will grab the value this returns, right? So this is the value that's actually returned. This expected value is the one we want. So this, if it's working properly, this should equal this, right? So we have the actual, which stores the return value, the expected, which is the value that we want. Um, here's the message. Don't worry too much about this. This is just a convenient message that sort of just is outputted when we do the assert equal. Uh, it doesn't actually affect the test itself, but it's good to have because you can see, oh, what's the actual value, what's the expected value, and we can see the function too. So it's just sort of a message that gets printed out as we do the self-assert equal. So this is the most important part, the, the part uh, that's really cool to understand. Self-assert equal will check the value of actual, check the value of expected, and you want these two to be the same. If these two are the same, then this test right here, this function that's called on these two will pass. And uh, assert equal also takes in an extra parameter, which is just your message, uh, which is basically just your message object. And it will also print this out too in a nice, nicely formatted way. So yeah, uh, ideally we want actual to be expected for this to pass. Um, and that's basically the main idea. We want to just check if our actual value is equal to our expected value. So the function does what we want it to do, essentially. OK. Uh, now a mutating example. So um, here is the idea. It's mostly the same, as you can see, as our previous one, except for a very key difference. Our actual value is just set to a list automatically. So we just have one, two, three instead of a function's return value. We then call modified list on actual, right? So we're modifying this. This isn't returning anything. This is just returning none, but it's acting on this object. Then we have the expected value, which we went over before. This is just the same thing we did last time, right? And we also have the message object, right? And this is, again, uh, just a convenient message to output after the test. And then we have self.assert equal. Uh, and this is just basically the same. We check if actual, the actual object here is equal to the expected object here. And if our test pass, passes, uh, these should be equal. So does anybody have any questions about the unit testing before I go on? Because I know there's probably a lot to take into. Um, Alex, try slowing it down a little bit. Um, I think we're going through quite fast. That's okay. Yeah. Is message of method um good question i think what this what message does is it takes in this and gives you a message object um it would be i think it's when you import unit testing this is a function mm -hmm. inside of there yeah yeah i think it's a helper function that takes in some parameters and outputs a message object basically um, don't worry too much about what a message object is. Um, oh, actually, no. It was a message that she made. So it was a helper function oh, on the right. sheet that right, right, right. Anya defined. Um, oh, it yeah. can be anything, but like, yeah. basically, so, it will display this message. And if there's an error with self.assert equals, it will display this message. Um, right. And in the way that Anya defined it as, it shows the actual, this is or like, this is the expected mm -hmm. value, but what we actually got was the actual value. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this will just basically give you a string 
Uh, and also, uh, just to answer a question in the chat, you do not need the message uh, argument for the unit test to be correct. You probably should have it if on like a test, just in case. I would recommend you do have it because it's kind of it is kind of important to check your output. Um, but uh, it's technically not required in the self dot assert equal, if I'm correct. Yeah, I don't Alex? think. Alex. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between the mutating and non-mutating example? Yeah, exactly. So let me go back to the non-mutating example. So uh, it's very subtle, but if you can see here, actual is being set to the return value of, a, of some function with an input list, right? So we just have this object as an input and we're, we're, this returns another object, which is set to actual. Um, so essentially this isn't, uh, acting or this isn't changing one, two, three, this specific object. It's instead taking in a specific object and then giving another return value, right? So uh, this and the return value of this are different objects in memory and actual is being set to re the return value of this. Um, in the case of the mutating example, we have the list actual, uh, which is set to one, two, three, right? it's not being set to the value of modify list because modify list doesn't return anything. Rather, it takes an actual and modifies this actual in memory, right? So we're actually not returning anything with this function. So setting actual to equal this in the mutating case would not uh, be good because, um, well, we're not really looking for a return value. We're looking for how exactly it modifies this in memory. So Alex? The, yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt again? Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, they were just discussing in the chat and there is a small error, which I also did not catch because uh, Java, but um, where it says class uh, test yeah. return list, that is supposed to be a colon. I just double checked with like- Oh, a, a colon? Max. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Instead of the curly bracket. <laughs> Okay, yep, yeah, I, I think I might have made that issue too. Uh, curly uh, brackets are for, really, yeah, for curly dictionaries. Curly brackets for Java, yeah, and dictionaries. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main idea is that it's contained in this class, uh, just pretend. I'll change it in the actual one. Yeah, just pretend that's a semicolon. I'm sorry, everyone. I've been too, uh, I've been doing too much Java lately. Um, but yeah, the main idea here is that it's modifying an object in the modif mutating example. So it's mutating it. It's changing the object in memory. Um, this one isn't changing anything in memory. It's just giving a new return value based on this list we put into it. But in this case, we're creating a list and then putting it into it and then checking that's equal to expected. Whereas this one, we're putting a list into it, setting its return value to equal something, then checking it's equal to expected. Does that make any sense? I know the difference is a little subtle. So if there's any confusions with that, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, we have another typo, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. There's only supposed to be one colon in that function yep. test return list. Yeah. I apologize. I think that might've been my fault actually. I put, might've put the actual one there. It's okay. Yeah. Are expected to create unit tests from scratch? Uh, I think you should know how to do it, yes. Um, but yeah, the main idea is you have this class, you have the actual value, the expected value. Oh, yes, uh, Sabrina, uh, feel free to go ask a question. Hi, um, sorry, I thought she said that she'd give us like one example and we just need to come up with others just modifying like what it would, what actual and expected would be. You mean for, you mean for the test? For the unit test, because even on the assignment, we weren't expected to come up with all of that stuff on our own. Yeah, I, I mean, you you don't have to like make the function itself. You just, you okay. just have to like do all this. Like, yeah. yeah that, no, I thought that's what the person was asking. Yeah, no, no, don't worry. You don't have to like actually create the function yourself. You okay, yeah. Do... I think like just to clarify, I think you might need to make the function, but all you would have to do is say def and then the name, like describing what it is and then self. I don't think she would expect you to do much else either than that, though. Um, it should be no, pretty. Oh, it's like the self-assert equal stuff. Yes, um, yes. So we'd have to do that because, like she said, she doesn't even remember how to do it, so she doesn't expect us to do it. 
I think sulfa dot assert equals like the main part of the unit test though, because that's what actually compares the two objects, right? So yeah. So you would need that for you would need to do that for your unit test. And what I oh, I don't know. Never mind. I'll just put it on Piazza. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Hmm. Um. I can okay. ask her about it. Yeah. I mean, I assume you'd like you'd have to do the actual expected message and then self us are equal but you only have to do like these four you, I, you might have to define message but that's really easy that just takes in these three things and returns a string so that's not too difficult um yeah okay um so i guess um if does anybody have any more questions about unit testing before we go on Yeah, yeah. If you have to use copy deep copy, uh, it will specify in the exam that it's uh, on there. Copy deep copy will just copy a list in memory essentially, so that it's um, you have another copy basically of that object. So uh, the the way you'd use that basically is you'd use it to check. Maybe you don't want the list to be mutated. All you want to check if it's not being mutated. You could use copy deep copy and then check if the list is still the same. Uh, deep copy copies any object, right? Um, yes, though I don't really think it's useful for anything that isn't mutating because there's not really any reason you'd have to create um, a copy, at least in the context of testing, for anything that isn't being mutated. Uh, so you'll mostly be using it on lists and dictionaries. Do we need to memorize self dot assert? Equal? Yeah, you should probably know self dot assert equal because that's the main part of unit testing. Can you explain copy deep copy? Yeah, sure. So let's say I have this list in memory, right? Uh, and I want a copy of it, right? Uh, and you know that if I just set another variable equal to that list, well, it's still pointing to the same memory address, but I don't really want that, right? I want it to, I want another copy of that list in memory. What copy deep copy does is it takes that list in memory and creates a new copy of it in a different memory address and then sets it equal to the variable I made. So instead of just having two variables that point to the same object in memory, you have another variable that points to a copy of that object in memory, but they don't point to the same memory address. So they point to two different objects. This is somewhat going out of the bounds of yeah. this course's scope. You will learn more about memory addresses and um, how different data types are stored in memory next semester. Um, the extent of what you need to know for memory and how data types are stored in memory is based on the memory model at the beginning of this course. Um, yeah, and just how it links with the address to each of the boxes. But for copy deep copy, the only thing that you need to know for it is that it creates a copy of the object and you'll only use it for lists. Is maybe CQ or everything essay. Um, Short answer or multiple choice. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. Um, I can't it says say the I, format, I think. I can't really say anything about the exam, unfortunately, because I don't know what it looks like. And I only have my own experiences to go off of. When I took it, it was multiple choice. There was half multiple choice and then half short answer, if that helps. How many parameters can assert equals? Um, it should only be taking in two parameters. Can it take in more? I don't think so. Uh, it can take I mean, in three. Well, the well yeah, like not, not counting the message, like how much can it take in? it's just two yeah i think it's just two not counting message messages like an alt like a an optional one but the two actual expected i'm pretty sure it can only take in two and within the realms of this course you'll only be worrying about comparing two objects at a time so yeah um any more questions about unit testing so the per yeah the third parameter prints message is your professor Nick or Brian or Anya? My professor for what? 
A oh, A oh, eight. Uh, it was technically Nick and Anya, but I, I went to Nick's lecture section. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of like yours, how you have, um, yeah, it's sort of like Marcello. how you Marcelo mm -hmm. and, um, and Anya. Okay, anyways, uh, if, so, so everyone, does everyone have their questions answered about unit tests or is there something you, uh, is there something anybody wants me to still go into quickly before we go on? Okay, um, so we don't have to use message. No, but you probably should. Yeah, you would need to define the message function though. Anya kind of just defines it herself in, in the unit test examples, but yes, you would have to define the message function. It's not really hard though. It's just a function that takes in the three parameters and puts them all together in a string. So you can just say, uh, we expected expected, but got actual out of return list or something like that. But yeah, it's just, a, is there a particular way to name a class? Classes aren't too important in this course. So no, uh, you'll just, uh, I think, yeah, I think it's uppercase, uh, but that's not too important. Um, yeah, we'll specify whether or not you need to create the function message. Um, and if she is doing that, then it'll also say like, you need to put in these parameters um, and you need to return this in this certain format. Um, uh, so I wouldn't in... worry too much about the message. Yes, uh, can we just put in message some string and use it without the function? I mean, I guess you could, but it's nice to just have the function. So that stuff's kind of out of view. Um, why do we have return list one, two, three in the message for example three? Um, we just have that so we know what the function call was because when you're testing, you wanna like look, oh, what were all these tests and what function was called? And so having that return list one, two, three in the string helps because we knew we, when it's printed out, we know what function's being tested on what input. Is the function call necessary? Um, no. The, or, or where do you mean the function call? Like, do you mean the function call in here? If so, then yes, because we need to know what the function returns. And in, in, in this spot, like modify list, yes, because again, we're testing the function. So we want it, we want to actually call the function inside our testing to see what it does. Uh, but if you're asking in the message, is it necessary? No, technically not, but you should be putting it there because it's good for testing because if it's not there, then that like, cool, I got the actual expected value, but what was the function called? Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna wait, see if anyone has any other questions. Um, so does anybody have any other questions about the unit testing? Would we have to code exit equals false in the end? No, I don't think so. Wait, so for the final, we won't need to make a class. I think it'll be specified if you have to make a class, probably not. I think she just wants to know that you understand the unit testing part itself. Uh, but I mean, creating the class isn't too hard. It's just class test return list and then the semicolons ignore the curly brace. Um, but yeah, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, yeah, I don't know about, how about the if name equals, oh, you mean the, the doc testing? Um, yeah. I don't think I, you'll have to code that. No, I don't think so. That um, is specifically for testing doc tests. Yeah. Um, it's just a small thing that's saying, uh, like you don't really need to understand it in this course, but that line, if underscore, underscore name, underscore, underscore equals name, um, <laughs> it, it basically means that if you are working directly on this file, um, then all of the different files, like it, it wants to check all of the different doc tests, 
which within this file. Um, you, I don't think you need to memorize it though. Yeah, don't, don't read too much about that. Where exactly do we get return list from in example three? Example three. Um, oh, oh, is yeah, this supposed sorry. to be modify list? Yeah, it was supposed to be modified list. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it should, it should be modified list. But um, yeah, just pretend this is modified list. But it's, it's the same idea. Good catch, though. Yeah, good, good catch. Good catch. It was in PCRS something about name. PCRS something about name name. Hmm. Uh, if you can show us after the presentation, I mean that would be good. Uh, if we can look it over. Um. Oh, sorry. Uh, does anyone have any questions about unit testing still, or are we good to go on? Side note on copy deep copy, use copy deep copy on nested lists and list copy on one layer list. I without mutable objects because using list copy and nested list copies on the memory addresses of each of the list. So there's aliasing. <laughs> deep copy makes new memory addresses to each sub list. This really this note list is aliasing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, you really don't need to know that for the test, though. But yeah, everyone else if. Don't, don't worry too much about that, but yeah, thanks for clarifying. Does any ever test something not covered in class, even though it was in the PCRS? I mean, my assumption would be if it's in the PCRS, it's probably fair game. Mm -hmm. She'll test you on course material. So who, if it was somewhere in the course, it's probably fair game. And PCRS counts as the course. Yeah, unless she specifically, um, unless she specifically says otherwise. In classes were taught in the PCRS. She might have tested a class. She might have done classes. Um, I don't remember going to into classes when I took the course, but classes aren't on the exam. Yeah. So if she says otherwise, then 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 her word trumps the fact that it's on the PCRS. Mm -hmm. So yeah, don't worry too much about classes. Um, don't know what the name equals main too. Yeah, don't worry too much about the name equals main thing. That's just for the doc tests. I linked Any the, idea... uh, the Piazza, sorry. Yeah. Any idea if assignment three will be released before? That? I have no clue about that, to be honest. Um... Sabrina says no, so. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Since it's so close to the exam, um, like tomorrow is the exam, I don't think it'll be extended because since your assignment was due on Friday or on Monday, um, and then accessibility students, they also, some of them, some of their accommodations account for like a couple more days extension. Um, she hasn't marked them all. Just curious, can you mutate copy deep copy? Do you mean oh. the copy, like the copy yeah. of the list or the object? Yeah, do you mean like, yeah, because if you're talking about whether you can mutate the function itself, no, because it's function. But if you're talking about the copy you got from the copy deep copy, then yes, it is a list. So you can mutate that list separately. It's just that the mutations in that list will not be seen in your previous list because they're technically two different objects in memory, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. So we have like, you can think of it as like, we have this one list and it's like, Okay, if I assign new variables to it, well, I'm just, I'm just basically have little boxes that all point to this one thing, but I don't want that. I want another one of those things. So I use copy new copy and it kind of clones this thing into its own box. And then I can assign a variable to that box. Why do we have to write code on paper? Um, I don't know. Durbin, I think it's for honest. syntax, like remembering, making sure yeah. that you get it like not also, relying on ids it's it's also uh it's also easier to proctor i guess people writing code on paper because if people can use their computers especially while we're online you get into that whole <laughs> thing of like people being able to like cheat easier because they could be typing and looking up answers online and it looks like they're coding so it's very hard to it's very hard it's harder to monitor people coding um 
don't you, don't worry there are courses where you won't have to write for bo7 our tests we don't write stuff but yeah for this one you do tried using a lockdown browser when the pandemic first hit no um, you don't that want was that Proctor you and you don't that, want that you, you don't that did not you don't, go well no don't guys don't don't do it don't wish for that <laughs> Um, on that note, let's take a 10 minute break because I know there's been a yeah. lot of content um, mm -hmm. and we'll jump back into this with uh, time complexity when we get back. Yeah. We'll be answering questions, but you can take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 3.05. Mm -hmm. I saw questions on past finals, which were about their semester's assignment three. So since we have no feedback on our assignment three, how would that go? Um, I guess you wouldn't test it because, or she could actually. Could. Um, she could, yeah. Uh, I, I really don't know what to say other than, uh, hopefully your assignment three is correct. Pray that it's on the final. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if well, it's like it was, it was shown in lecture. Um, I, there were a couple examples. Like I've seen the content left. It's all been talked about in lecture and questions like examples solved in lecture, as well as PCRS going over it as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is all testable material. Alex, you're in second year. I'm technically in second year still, but I'm in my yeah. third year of studying. Oh, oh yeah, uh, I'm in second year. I'm a second year student as well. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that question. Yeah. If we final, we shouldn't be expected to write out our own unit testing. Do you guys, from do you guys get paid for being Tate? Yeah, we do. Uh, I'm not allowed to disclose how much, uh, but yeah. 367 exam. I mean, it went relatively okay. I mean, that was, that was so long ago. That was like mm. two years ago for me now. Ours was, uh, <laughs> it was something. It was something. <laughs> uh, my tip is just get really good at proofs and you should be fine. Keep practicing proofs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never really get perfect at proofs. Proofs are proofs are a skill you build up. They are hard. Yep. Um proofs and logic. Yeah, I mean. See, the thing about proofs is you can't really memorize anything, but you can it's really easy to practice. So Will there be, yeah, there is a review seminar uh, held by AMAC as well. A31 proofs. A31. <laughs> That's a course. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a course. For me, A67 was harder. Um, yeah. I liked A31 more. Uh, I got a 68 in A31, so <laughs> I kind of got clapped by that course, but apparently it's supposedly people tell me it's easier. So I guess I was just really bad at A31. A37 is more fun though. It's yeah. a lot more fun. The contents, the prof is great. I, you, you, I, I know you all will love Professor Kathleen. What program am I in? Uh, what program am I in? I am a double major in math and computer science. So yeah, I do. No delta epsilons in A37. Yeah, I don't there, think. There, there is sequence proofs, which are similar, but uh, they're much easier to work with. You yeah. memorize proofs? Uh, yeah, you can basically. I mean, there. How Kathleen usually does exams is most of the stuff is just material you'd know if you practiced and did all the exercises, and then she'll have like one proof question that's particularly hard. I thought we can't combine math and CS majors since they are in the same. No, you can do that. I think there's just certain restrictions like you can't do a a stats minor with like a CS major. You can't do. Uh, you read that somewhere. Yeah, that's uh that's false actually because my. Uh, yeah, I'm in math and see, I, I asked Natalia. 
a math major just sounds so stressed, dude. I, I'm going to be real with you. Uh, my, my CS courses are a lot more stressful than my math courses. See, um, I find the opposite too, though. Like, I find math a lot harder. Yeah. Um, but comm sci is relatively, it's okay. It's fun. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on what you like. Again, just do something you enjoy and you'll probably be able to handle it all. So, um, but yeah, you can combine math and CS. I, I think you can do stats and CS as well. I know people who did do that. Uh, message your program coordinators, obviously. Can I not, no, yeah, you can just take, you. well, I mean, after first year, other than I think B24 and B52 and B- A lot of them are comp sci courses, but then it becomes math. Like yeah. Alex, do you want to explain B36 right now? Yeah, so, okay. Um, <laughs> B36 is like a computer science theory course, but it's like all math based. Like so you're doing proofs, you're, you're doing lemmas, theorems, a lot, a lot of uh, very mathy stuff. And a lot of the CS courses you'll take in upper year two, like C27 or C37, I don't remember what it was. C37 um, and C73. Yeah, they'll be very mathy too, so but i think like you can just do the hardware and software courses after that but you will need a lot of, you will require a lot of math so uh yeah b41 um yeah it's not a hard course um yeah but just expect to do a lot of math uh in cs because there is a lot of it i didn't um, realize how much there was when i went in here do you do a bunch of proof of correctness for it? Yes, you do actually. There's an entire unit about proving program correctness. So I hope oh. you enjoy proving, proving. Vim, is that the like the virtual machines or like VM? Do you like I've used I actually VMware don't know what before. Vim is. I don't know what I've used Vim it is. for my work. I don't know if it's Vim though. I feel like I should know what it is, but I don't. Yeah, it sounds really familiar. Also, Aldo, I think there are ones with computer hardware. Like, there's a robotics course. I think it's yeah. C85. Um, and Paco teaches it. And yeah. you get to play with robots. And yep. this year, he challenged his students to create, like, since the pandemic, he can't throw chocolates. And that used to be, like, a signature Paco move. So he asked his robotics people to make a robot that can, like, basically catapult chocolates to students somewhat safely <laughs> also um, Paco teaches all the fun courses yeah yes. yeah, he's a, yeah you can use it yeah oh. I'm pretty sure that's the one they recommend actually you use that that's what my TAs used anyway so yes you can use Visual Studio Code I think that's what they want you to use because that's much better all. than notepad don't, don't go to notepad plus don't, don't use don't no. use notepad that's really not good <laughs> um yeah um uh, Wings King. man Wings, Wings you right. haven't you haven't tasted other ides though yeah i i prefer, um, but it's got a good debugger mm -hmm. i i prefer uh what's the one for python um <laughs> eclipse who's for java spider I, I think so i don't remember there's one that's really nice for python but i just don't remember do you guys think well, done? yeah, I've heard that you have another exam. Yeah. You should be okay. I'm honestly, I'm really sorry that you have it. Are the maths back. easier in your opinion in second semester? Well, okay, take this with a grain of salt because <laughs> I am a math major. Uh, yeah. Likes math. He's a he's a math god. Yes I, I dislike ish. math. Most people seem to dislike math and CS, and I kind of understand why. Uh, I've heard B fifty two is very hard. But B24 and B41 are pretty easy. They're a lot easier than the first year courses, um, I'd say. Uh, if you have a solid grasp on linear algebra, B24 is mostly just an extension of that. Yeah. Um, it also depends on who's teaching B41. It can be easy or I not. I like math. I don't like proofs. Oh. <laughs> those two go so close together. Unfortunately, those two go to get those two go together like a lot like I'm taking a class called B43 right now and it's like it's like A31 think A31 but like with all proofs basically it's just all proofs 
Hey, Alex, I just made a live transcript because it was requested by a student. Yep, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's 3.05 if you want to get back yeah. to starting. Let us get back. Um, give me a second. Here we go. Okay, just going to make sure everyone's uh, you know, all here. Um, okay, so we're past unit testing now. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. 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 Hi. I don't think they can hear us. Oh, okay. What's your name? Oh, my name is Alex. My name's Katrina. Okay, you can continue, yeah. Alex. Let's uh, let's 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 go on. Okay, yeah. So time complexity. So this uh, informally basically refers to how fast a function will run. So time complexity kind of gives us a language to describe how fast a function sort of runs in. Don't worry too much about understanding this in depth. It's not really required that you understand this super well for this course. You'll go more in depth into it in A48, but we'll just go over the basics. Um, so we have different uh, classes essentially of complexities. So we have a constant time complexity, which is one, two, three, you know, things that run in one iterations, two iterations, three iterations, right? We all have a linear time. Now we have a variable X here. So your program might be dependent on a variable, right? So the size of a list or the size of a database or whatever your, whatever kind of data you're accessing, uh, it might be a variable. It might be a variable depending on, you know, what kind of data you're accessing. So linear time refers to the programs that run in X time or two X or three X, right? So they're, they run according to your variable essentially. So how much um, how much time you, or how big your variable is essentially. And if you wanna remember, right, what linear time means, it's linear, it's just a linear equation, right? So you probably know from your high school math courses or the math courses this year that linear, linear just refers to linear functions. So functions of X to the power of one, right? Now quadratic time, um, refers to functions that run uh, at times time your variable squared, right? So you would have that same variable, but it's gonna run uh, that variable squared times, right? So let's say my database is, has eight objects and I wanna loop through all of them, or my list has eight objects and I wanna loop through all of them, right? Um, and I wanna loop through all of them again. That would, get, that would uh, result in me looping through its X squared times, right? We'll go more into that when we go into examples. So don't worry too much if you still don't understand right now. This is just the, the language you're gonna to use to describe it. Uh, just ignore polynomial time here. Technically polynomial, these, both of these fall into this classification, but don't worry too much about this. This is sort of just an all encompassing sort of word that refers to complexities that are a polynomial basically. So these would be a polynomial, these would be a polynomial, um, yeah. Now, how, uh, how can we tell uh, what time an algorithm runs it? So we'll, we'll go over a few examples and the general you know, way of thinking about this, at least in this course. So let's say we have, give me a second. Yeah, so, uh, so for a regular loop that goes through uh, a list of K elements, we get a linear runtime of K. So for instance, when uh, the length of our list is equal to k, right? So we have a list that's size k. If we go through the list i time, or we go through, we loop through the list using this index i, right? And we have it's in the range of lists. We're doing i in range, um, we're looping through i until we reach the, the size of k, right? We do the thing. So we're gonna be doing the thing k times, which means k iterations, right? So we can say the time complexity or at least in this course, the amount of iterations or the amount of times we call some function is gonna be K, right? Now, it's important to note that some loops can have constant runtime. So for instance, we just said for I in range three, we do a thing, right? This is just gonna do a thing three times. It doesn't matter you know, what list we input or what size is this or that. We're only gonna be doing the thing in here three times. 
So this has a time complexity of three. Um, complexity can also be cut in half, right? So if we have a list that's of length k, and we, you know, we go through, we loop through it like we did up here, instead, but instead we add one to it each time, then note, we'd have i equals zero, we do the thing, add one, so that we're, we're at i equals one, so then we're going to iterate through i again, we'll be at i equals two, and basically this will cut the amount of iterations in half, because we're going to be incrementing i by two instead of one each time. So i will get, uh, i will get up to the length of the list in double, or in, uh, less uh, one half, essentially half the amount of time because we're going through I much quicker. Uh, yeah, so does anybody have any questions about this? There, yeah, there are, I just wanna make it clear there, the polynomial runtime uh, isn't the only uh, type of runtime. There are many others, there are logarithmic, exponential, but they aren't important, don't worry. If you don't understand any of those, they're not important to this course. We're just foc focusing on linear, constant and quadratic for this course. Nothing else is too important for this course. Shouldn't be a while loop. Yeah, you can do for while. Um, yeah, the idea is essentially the same though, right? I just sort of made it a for loop here because it might be a little bit easier to see the actual amount of iterations, but you can apply it to either. Like the idea the, the idea here is essentially the same. So if we, if we had like, for example, while i is less than length of l, and then we iterated through i, we added one to i each time. It's doing the same amount of things, right? So anything you can do with a while loop, we do with a for loop. Um, Alex? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. can I just make a, a, I think a correction for that last yeah. example? Mm -hmm. um, so for the for loop, if we add one to i inside of the for loop, I don't think it'll actually add it on the next iteration. It'll just oh, overwrite right. it. Yep. So to do yep. that instead, you would do, I'll type it in the chat, but yeah. range zero length of L, and then you would do it by a step of two. Yep. Yeah, so, so I apologize for this error, but the idea, um, the idea is that we're gonna be going through I, so we'll do, we would do while I is, I think less than length of L, add one to I and then do our thing. And we go through that half, in um, half the amount of time. Now, technically speaking, uh, and this isn't really important to this course, so don't don't um, don't worry too much about this. We technically don't consider constants when it comes to complexity classes, but uh, for this course, we will be considering complexities of k over two. Technically speaking, if you have a constant next to your term, you would just disregard it when considering complexity classes. But uh, yeah. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, what about composition of loops? So what if I have a loop in a loop, right? Um, well, generally we will multiply the complexity of the composed loops. So if we have a list, uh, which is of uh, size K, then we go through, if we go through for I in range len L, and then we have a loop within that loop. So we're going for, for J in range len L. So we're gonna loop through uh, the list uh, we're gonna loop through the list k times, k times, right? So we'd multiply those, right? Because we're doing we're doing k k times k, right? So we're gonna loop through the list k times, and we're gonna do that k times, right? Because we have this, then we're go doing this like k times, right? But we go back here, we add one to i, and we go through j k times. So we're doing k iterations k times. And note this also applies to while loops as well if we just said well i is less than or equal to len l and same for j right it's the same idea we'd be we'd be adding one to i then adding one to j in here and yes it, it, would, it would essentially be the same concept now if it was a while loop we would also be uh, initializing j up here so it resets uh three case linear k squares yeah exactly correct idea right this is a quadratic equation essentially. So you can just think about it like in terms of like math, like you probably remember from your math courses um, that this is a polynomial term or this is a quadratic term. So uh, something to the raise to the power of two, this is a linear term, right? And obviously uh, here we have, we're going through the list um, K times and then we're going through this three times, right? So we're going through this three times, k times, right? Because we have i, we're going through that once, then we do this three times, a second time, three times, all the way up to k. 
So we'd multiply three by K giving us a three K time complexity. Yeah, no problem. Okay, now for the last part of this review seminar, sorting algorithms. So we're gonna be covering three main sorting algorithms, just the ones that were covered in lecture. Uh, and these are really important to know, especially going into upper year courses and probably for your exam. So this is probably gonna be the most important part of this review seminar. So here's all the different types of sorts with their complexities. So for selection sort, there is no best case, there's no worst case. And I believe this is because it's dependent on the size of your list, if I'm correct, Katrina. So it depends on like what you're putting into it. Can you take over? Yeah, yeah, go go right ahead. I think Katrina would be better off to explain this to you also. Yes, yeah, she can take over. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so the exact, oh, I guess I'll share my screen. One yeah. Second. I didn't realize that you were in dark mode, which is quite interesting. Oh. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Can you all see it? Okay. Can you see it? I, I can see it, but uh, let me just check the chat in case anyone else can see it. Okay, awesome. Okay. Yeah, so we have three different uh, sorting algorithms, as Alex was saying. We have selection sort and insertion sort. Um, depending on what which lecture section you were in, uh, you might not have completed all of selection sort or insertion sort. And then bubble sort, I don't even think it was mentioned in lecture, but or in some lecture sections, but it is still important due to it being added to the sorting code in like in the lecture section on CSCA 08 in that uh, in that section. So section sort, yes, yeah, as Alex was saying, selection sort, it's dependent on the size of the list and it doesn't matter whether or not it's already ordered. So that's why there is no best or worst case. It always has the same time complexity. Um, and in this case, it'll be quadratic and I'll explain it a little bit later. Uh, the comparisons are always the same. So it's n times n minus one divided by two. Anya proved this in class and I believe Marcelo did as well. Uh, insertion sort, this is the only one that actually has a best and worst case scenario. So best case, it's already sorted. And since insertion sort only compares the value directly below the uh, value that you're looking at, um, if they are in order, then this actually matters for the implementation of insertion sort, and it'll go a lot faster. Whereas the worst case is quadratic. Um, and in here, comparisons, there's n squared. For bubble sort, same as selection sort, there's no best or worst case scenario. Um, all cases are quadratic and the comparisons are n squared as well. And we'll go over some examples, don't worry. Uh, sorry, are you able to explain again um, why there's no best or worst case for selection sort? Uh, yeah, so for selection sort, inside of here, um, there is a list, list L. Uh, it's in this picture right now. So the sorted part of the list will be the left side and I is the value or the position, sorry, that we will be looking at. And how selection sort is implemented is we look at the rest of the unsorted part of the list for the smallest value and we find that index and we return that index. And whatever that index is, once we've gone through the entire unsorted list, then we switch that with the value that we're looking at. And if it's the same value, it doesn't matter. It still has to go through the entire unsorted list. And then it adds one to that index that we're looking at. And that, that part that we just found that was the smallest part, it gets added to the sorted list. So even if it's in order, we don't know where the smallest value is inside of the list. So we have to keep checking the unsorted part each and every time until we find that smallest value. Does that make sense? 
why does bubble sort not have a best and worst case? Uh, so this is a little easier to explain. So again, uh, because bubble sort, what bubble sort does is kind of does like comparisons, like based on the size of your list, right? Uh, the issue with that is, is the fact that um, it's always going to be dependent on the size of the list because dependent on how much like comparisons it's going to be making is again, how big the list is. And um, it's always going to be some N examples squared. as well. Yeah, don't worry. It's always going to be n squared because you're 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 looping through the list, uh, the size of the list times, right? Because we're going to be looking at two elements and then switching them if one's bigger than the other. And we're going to be doing that, but we're going to be doing that as many times as the list uh, as the list size essentially. So we know that all elements are um, sorted properly. To cover binary searches in class. Also, can you go over how you got the comparisons? Oh, for bubble sort, uh, it's actually really simple. So we look we look at two elements in the list side by side, and let's say this element, the the second element, is smaller is smaller than the first, and we're going to swap them because we want the element that comes later in the list to be the bigger one. What is this? Okay. Sorry, Papa. What what is this? Bubble sort is another uh, sorting algorithm. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Sorry, I, I think it'll make more sense once we actually go over some examples. Yeah. So let's go into it. Yeah. Hold on. So selection sort uh, it finds the smallest value in the list from index i to the length of the list, so the unsorted part of the list, and swaps the smallest value, so it has to search for it in the entire unsorted list, with the value at the ith index, or whichever value is at i index. Um, and i is the first element in the unsorted part of the list, and as we use selection sort, we keep increasing that as one until we get to the entire sorted list. So again, here's the implementation of selection sort. You can find this as well on uh, Anya's website. Under lecture section, it's the sorted code. So this is how selection sort works. For i in range length list, we go through the entire length of it. And this is the i at the beginning. We use this helper function that we define here called get index of smallest list at position i. So as you can see here, as I increases in this loop in selection sort, I will keep getting pushed slowly but surely closer to the end of the list. Um, and then from the position you can see in get index of smallest, at first we have a default value, it's just I. Um, and then from I plus one to the end of the list, we try to figure out where the smallest index is. Um, and yeah, and that's why we always have to, like, there's no best or worst case scenario. It's because we don't know what the sorted, unsorted part of the list looks like. So we always have to go through the entire part of the unsorted list um, to find that smallest index or get the index of the smallest value. Does that make sense? Alex, are there any questions in the chat or are we good? Yeah, they're just asking about like whether um, they'll be asked to write like a full sorting algorithm or just fill in the blanks. And I believe Anya said that, at least people are saying, Anya said in um, class that they would only need to fill in. So, if, that's what so yeah. if that is what Anya said, then yeah, just take her word for it. Mm -hmm. So here's an example for best and worst case. I have this random list, six, zero, one, five, and 10. The first time we go through, it will look through the entire list. So the entire unsorted list is um, like, the index is at zero. So it's the entire list. The smallest value is zero. So we switch it with six, which is at position zero. The next time we pass through or the next iteration, I equals one. So this zero value, is already sorted. 
So we look through the rest of the remaining part. So sorry, the way that I classified it here is that the dark blue is already sorted and we don't touch it again. Um, and yellow, like the highlighted yellow value, that is the smallest index. So once we find that, then we switch it with the value um, at position I, whichever the smallest value is. Um, at pass three, I equals two. So we don't touch zero and one. We find the smallest in the smallest value in the remaining indices that we haven't looked at yet. So we switch five and six. Um, and we keep going through here. So see how six, it's already in the correct position, but we still need to check it against the entire rest of the unsorted list. So we just leave it in the same spot. Um, and then the last one, it's just 10. Uh, Durbin's asking, would we have to know how to sort from big to small and vice versa? Um... Sorting algorithms are always smallest to largest. Yeah, it, it should that be the, the smallest question being asked? first. Yeah, that, that I think that's what uh, Dervin meant. So yeah, I, I would assume. Asked to sort it the other way. Yeah, I mean, I, I would assume that they just expect you to sort it smallest at the front, biggest at the back. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll go into insert and sort. Hopefully I explained selection sort well enough. Um, so it starts at the beginning of the list. It moves, oh yes, yeah, Sabrina. Sorry, was that example best case or worst case? It was both. Since selection sort doesn't have a worst or best, uh, it was a randomized one. Okay, thank you. Um, so insertion store it starts at the beginning of the list, it moves towards the end, and basically it compares all of the values, or sorry, it compares the one value right below it. And if it is, it keeps switching until it is incorrect in the correct space. So insertion sort is the only one of these sorting algorithms that we're presenting with you today that has a worst and best case scenario. There are others, but we're not going to talk about it in this course. So it inserts the ith element in the correct position in the sorted part of the list. So for instance, uh, she went over this in class as well, but let's say i is 5. We would compare 5 with the value 6 first. We would switch them because they're lower. Uh, we would switch 5 and 6 again. And then once 5 is here, we would compare four and five. And since four is not greater than five, then we would leave it and that's it. So you can see how, if this is already in order, and I'll give an example of best and worst case scenario, then it only has to make one comparison before moving on and increasing the value of i. So here's the implementation again. Um, we have insertion sort, it goes through the entire length of the list um, and it calls this helper function insert. So inside of here, you can see the value is list at position I. So we find the actual value of it. And this is using a while loop. So while I is greater than zero, while we haven't reached the beginning of the loop or the list and the value directly behind the value that we're looking at, if that's greater than the value, then we move it. Otherwise, we break the loop and we go back and we go back to that for loop again. We move to the next one. That way we're not wasting time looking through um, kind of like selection sort, but looking through that unsorted list for the smallest one, regardless of what the value is. This is a more efficient way of how to spend our time or at least our computing time. It may be the matter of a mill like a millisecond, but in bigger companies, in the real world, that millisecond could cost a lot of time and money. So here's an example of a worst case. I know it looks a little scary, I'm sorry, um, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So we have this list that is in exactly reverse order. So we have 27, 13, 11, four, and one. So we start at the beginning, we have 27. We're gonna, gonna say that's the sorted part. We're gonna leave it there. Pass two, 
we're comparing um, the last, like the value directly beside it, so 27, and we're comparing 13. And since 27 is greater than 13, we're gonna switch those values. Pass three. We have this value 11 here. We're gonna compare it not with 13 yet. We're gonna compare it to 27 first. Because to the left side, that's all sorted right now, but we wanna add or in, uh, like insert this new value in the correct spot. So 11, we compare it to 27, we switch those two, and then we compare again, 13 to 11. We also have to switch those two. Um, and as you can see, we keep going through this. So 27 and four, and then we keep moving the four down all the way until it's in its correct position. So this is the worst case scenario because we have to completely flip the list. Does anybody have any questions about that before I go to the best case example? Don't think I can see the chat, but Alex, is there anything pressing? I don't see any more questions, so I don't think so. If, if anyone does have any questions, do be sure to ask them right now because we will be going on. Doesn't pass one start at I equals one? Oh, I think, sorry. I think it does. Yeah. So like in here. Um, yeah, uh, no, actually, it does start at zero. So it's while I is greater than zero, it'll still yeah. call insert. Um, but then this while loop will immediately break and it'll go to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so at the I equals zero part, it just it disregards that case basically. Yeah. Is there more than one way to code sorting algorithms? Yeah, there's probably more than one implementation of this algorithm. Um, that the we're just going over the implementations that were covered in class, but yes, there are more than one ways to code an algorithm. There are several sorting algorithms, yeah. a lot more that you'll uh, discuss mm -hmm. in the next class. Yeah. I, I think the important part is understanding the algorithm itself, like how it works. So if she gives you any implementation to fill in the blanks with, you'll know what to do, right? Because you understand if you understand the abstract concept of the algorithm, then you know any anything she throws at you should be pretty easy to. Uh, deal with. I didn't have the chat open. I think I can just have it on the side. Easy, just do dot reverse. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could do that. Yeah. All facts, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you could do that. You could just do dot reverse. I mean, then, that also does, like, it's basically doing what insertion sort is. It probably, like, dot reverse is an external library, or it's it's an external, like, a built-in function. And this is probably the way that it was implemented. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> reverse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you're understanding, like, what's happening in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Just do dot sort. <laughs> Of course. How could we be so silly, Katrina, implementing oh, our man. own algorithms? Why would we use wow. our own algorithms when we have wow. dot sort? It's already <laughs> just use dot sort. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's, it's seriously, it is important to understand like the concepts behind the algorithms and stuff. Because um, that this is specific to Python. Python's a what they call a high-level language, which means that they have a lot of helper functions, and you can't do like really simplistic stuff, if that makes sense. Like you can't easily manipulate memory or where each address it. This will make sense in A48. Um, to in those of you case. who are worried about this, this is all outside of the scope. So don't worry about like pointers and recursion in, and all those fancy <laughs> words. In which cases would Tim sort be slower than these? Well, it's Tim sort, so I think all the cases. So for, I'm, I'm gonna go on to best case. Yeah, let's, let's go on. <laughs> so don't, don't worry case. about it, don't worry about it. It's a really bad, it's a purposely bad sorting algorithm. Yeah, don't worry about it. 
Um, so we've got the list list in insertion sort. This is the best case example. So it's already sorted. And what you can tell here is that instead of looking through the entire list, we only compare right beside each other. So I think there's actually supposed to be a pass five. Um, but on pass, like when I is equal to one, you compare four and one. And then uh, you see already that one is not greater than four. So you just leave it be. And since the left side is already sorted, you know that whatever value you're comparing right beside it, you don't need to compare it. Like if it's not greater, that previous left value, then you don't need to keep going down it. So in this case, this would be a linear time complexity. <laughs> oh man. Last but not least, we have bubble sort. Um, some of you might not completely understand how it works. Don't worry, it's easy, I swear. Alex, you can back me up as well. So it's, essentially, it's you're gonna traverse the entire list up to the specified ith last index and keep comparing, uh, moving the largest value to the end of the list. It's almost like reverse selection sort. Once the largest value is at the end, the function finds the next largest value and moves that to the second last position of the list. So it's easier to explain with an example, but here is the implementation first. So we have um, bubble sort, we have this loop, it goes backwards this time. So we start, I start at, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you okay. just cut out just a little bit. Yeah, I just froze, sorry. Okay, so we're going from the back of the list. So I first gets the value of the length of the list and that negative one. So remember how range is sort of organized. We have where we start at, where we end, and the, the step pattern. So since it's a minus one, it's gonna go be going in reverse order. So bubble up, we start from I being at the very end, which means that we're gonna go through the entire list looking for that largest value. And what it does is it compares the values right beside each other. So in bubble up, this function that we've made, uh, it starts from one into the end, which is the I that we're passing in. If the value to the left is directly greater than the value right beside it on the right, then you switch them. And you keep going through it until the end. And once that largest value is at the right, then we uh, will obviously bubble up, we'll stop, and we'll go back to bubble sort, and that for loop will increment to be length of the list minus one, because that's our step pattern now. So now we'll keep going through the list. Here, I'll, I'll show you an example. So let's say we're going through this list at the end of the list first, right? So we're gonna compare the values right at the beginning. So six to zero. Six is greater than zero, so we're gonna switch that. Is six greater than seven? No, so we're gonna leave those be. Seven is greater than five? We're gonna switch those, yes. And is seven greater than one? seven is greater than one. And so now we have seven is the sorted part of this list. Now we start back at the beginning, but we will not check that last value seven that has already been sorted. So we'll compare, is zero greater than six? No, we leave it. Is six greater than five? Yes, it is, we're going to switch it. Is six greater than one? Yes, it is, so we're gonna switch it and now, since we're not comparing the end part, like length of the list, that last index, which I know is length of the list minus one, now we have the sorted value of length of the list minus two. So we keep going through this. So now zero compared to five, no, zero is still less than five. Five is greater than one, yes it is. So we're gonna switch it. And then we compare the last value zero and one, um, and then that's the end of sorting. So why it's called bubble sort, you're kind of 
bubbling each of these values, these comparisons right beside each other. There's no looking for the smallest uh, value and looking for its index. There's no, it, it's kind of like insertion sort where you're comparing right beside each other, but insertion sort will stop immediately once you've found it. So, sorry, I don't, I don't think I understand the question. Mobile sort work on three consecutive items or, or is it limited to, are you asking if there's an implementation of bubble sort that, that checks three items instead of two? Um, there might be, it might be called something different. This is the simplified yeah. version though. There, there yeah. probably, there probably is something like that out there. Um, bubble sort specifically yeah. acts on two because comparing three items would be a nightmare or not like a little bit, a little bit harder than trying to compare two. And it would- Cause you have to have like the list be at least length of yeah. three. And it wouldn't- You might get an index in here. It wouldn't be particularly faster either cause you'd still be doing the comparisons, right? Cause you'd still have to compare all three. So yeah, it would just be the same basically just more work. And since it doesn't matter what order um, the list is in, like regardless, it's all counted as the unsorted list. And then the ending part is the sorted list and it slowly bubbles up to get the largest values versus selection sort, which keeps the lowest values. So that's well, why, even though it's not sorted or if it's unsorted, it'll still have to go through it all. Yeah, The amount of passes in bubble sort would be lemless minus one, right? Correct. That's the, that's the exact idea basically, yep. You're going through the list, a line of list time, or you're you're bubbling up a line of lists minus one times. And yeah, that's our last example. So yeah. if I, I hope you guys enjoyed, I hope it makes sense. If you have any more questions or you want to ask about like certain slides or what'll be on the final, let us know. We'll be here until four. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, just want to clear something up before we go into questions. Uh, when I talked about Tim sort being slow, I, I apologize. That was actually misinformation. I was thinking of Bogo sort. Uh, yeah, Tim sort is actually really useful. I think it's n log of n time complexity, I believe. Uh, so I, I, I can't. I can't really answer your your question like which cases would be faster or slower. You'll probably learn more about merge sort and like recursive based sorting algorithms in A48. So yeah, uh, yeah, just want to clear that up because I don't want to be spreading misinformation. So yeah, just, just clearing that up. Anyways, uh, opening up the questions now. Also, thank you, Sabrina. Bogosort can be written in two lines though. I mean, I can write while true in like one line, so. <laughs> that's still not, that's, that's not, I mean, I can write while true in one life. <laughs> but it needs to stop. Uh, the passes, yeah, in bubble sort are length of list minus one. Selection and insert yeah. passes is length of list. Ah, I can sort, double check. Bogo sort's not stopping until like a year passes. So like since insertion start, starts at zero, then yes, it'll go through the entire length. Well, up to length of list minus one, but also it includes zero. So technically the length of list and then selection sort also goes through the entire list. Yeah. Someone's asking how many iterations would there be for insertion sort? Oh, actually, no, I, I know this. I know this actually. So it's, okay. I believe it's the sum of i from i equals zero to n, if I'm correct. And that right, becomes yeah. n times n minus one divided by two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I think oh, that's I think correct. I, I think then I switched that. Uh, yeah, the, yeah I, I think someone was mentioning that in chat. I think the complexities might be switched up, but yeah. I'm sorry. I, no, it's fine. Don't, don't. It's so 
I think the, the, yeah, the idea is basically for the first iteration, you are adding, you're looking through the, the unsorted part, I believe once and then twice and then three. So I'm sure you all are uh, at least familiar with Sigma notation. So it's like, it's just, uh, I can write in the chat Sigma I from, from I equals, it's one to N, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that, which is, I think you proved, you might have proved this in A36, but yeah, it's equal to this, correct? A31, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these last like 15 minutes are just for questions. Yeah. So if you want to leave, you, you can at this point. It's good to see you all. Best of luck on your exam all of them. I know some of you have two exams tomorrow and then A67 also on Saturday. So I wish you more luck. We'll probably prove it in A30. Yeah, you, that, that's when we think. Oh, no problem, Jason. Uh, we'll probably prove it in A37 when we do. Yeah, you will, you will prove those. Oh, yeah, A30. Riemann sums. Yeah, yeah. We love Riemann sums. We, we, they're nice. <laughs> um, uh, should I stop the recording? Um... I don't know. I mean, like if someone asks a useful question, it might be good to just get it down, but it's up to you. Good luck on your exams, Alex. Thank you. Good luck on your exams. Thank too, you. Or Joseph, yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Joseph. Yep. You too. Good luck on yours too. Test function for each test example of the function. Yeah, I think you... Sorry, can you clarify the question a little bit? So do you mean, so we need to create a test function. Do you mean like you need to create a new test function in your unit test module each time you want to test an example of the function? Something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, you would. You would have, if you want to test like a different functionality of that function or that function on a different input, then yes, you would have to create a new test function for each case you want to test. Rip my A3 marks. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> no. Ah. <laughs> no. I'm sure you'll do fine still. I'm sure you'll um and yeah, so Terraria will be later. Um, so for clarification, Alex and the others, basically, um I I hosted a Terraria challenge for three hours. We actually did it for four hours and we got so close to like halfway. But um, yeah, so we did a, that was for a different position. So I have like several positions and they're all almost all related to this TA course. So I'm a first year peer. I send your emails, some of you. Um, I'm also TA. That's also not why I'm doing this. This is, I'm a comm sci representative for AMAX. So first year peer, I host socials like cohort socials uh, with the people I send emails. Other people can join as well. Um, but we hosted, I think it was two days ago, a three hour Terraria session. Um, it was just kind of like a relaxing thing. And we got quite a few people. So I was quite happy about that. It'll probably, we'll probably host another one later, maybe in January, if we can get it in December, maybe. But I mean, it's pretty busy with exams. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop the the recording yeah. just because